Hey everyone, and welcome back to this video, part two of the very exciting creating a to-do list app series. And that's only a little bit sarcastic because I am actually excited about this episode. Today, we're going to be hooking up the Noodle backend. So um, this is something that we'll probably come back and talk about several times is uh, Noodle's ability to, to either use its own integrated backend, which you can either love or hate, I love it. Some people are not such a fan of it, or you can hook it up to something external. So this episode could have easily been about um, connecting up this app that we're making to a Superbase backend by using the Superbase prefab or a Xano backend and using the Xano prefab. Um, in the end, it's always it's all kind of the same. What we're doing, what we're trying to understand today, is more how do you how do you understand repeaters. So repeated dynamic items in Noodle as a front end. And how do we understand updating, deleting the, what we call CRUD, create, read, update, and delete element of a development project. So we have this task list app. We obviously need dynamic data to be able to add tasks, to update them, to read them and delete them, or else there's not much point in making it. So. That's really what we're talking about today and uh, why we're doing this lesson. Whether you love or hate the Noodle backend, it's just an example of how you can connect what you're looking at here with some source of data that will allow you to do the create, read, update, and delete functions that we're going to look at today. Why I love the Noodle backend is because it already has all the little Noodle cloud data nodes that have been made by the lo lovingly made by the Noodle team back in the days that connect to the Noodle backend. So um, this is just my preference. If you want to follow along, I really recommend you use the Noodle backend because it's going to be the easiest way to learn. Um, you probably saw in another guide that I did, I showed how to set up the Noodle backend. Um, if you didn't look at that, there's a link to it in the paper guide that you should be following along with because it's nice to follow a paper guide. And if not, and like me, you've forgotten to start your Noodle backend and you had it already started, get Docker open, and like the guide says, have a look. I'll just make sure that your, your backend is running. So I have a test backend running that I'm going to use. Make sure that it's um, saying running two out of two because it's running MongoDB and um, the cloud service that will allow you to read data from MongoDB. Um, so let's close that off and get working on the guide. So when we are in our Noodle project, we're going to click on the Cloud Services icon. And we're going to go to, so we, we would then click on the um, plus icon and add, like you saw in the video, and add the back end, but I've already added it as this one here. So I'm going to, because I added it and I haven't actually brought it into the editor yet, it means that the back end is in my list of available back ends, but this particular project is not going to reach out to that editor yet, to that backend yet. So I need to say add use an editor and then I'll add it up here and it says used in editor. That means that this backend is used in the editor. So that's perfect. And uh, we've already made sure that the service is running. So that's perfect. Now we're going to add a class. So as the note says in the noodle backend or in what is called parse server, which is the open source tool that the Noodle backend uses, created by Facebook. No, created by somebody back in the days, bought by Facebook, sold, made open source by Facebook. I can't remember. So there's a whole story behind it, but it's a nice tool. It's very lightweight and it uses um, a little bit different language. It calls, so we're going to click on open dashboard and you'll see it calls um, a, data a database table, which is called tables in standard SQL type language. They call class. And that's fine. So we have classes, it's the different tables. So we already have a role, a session, a user table. I have some tables that I created for another project. Sorry, but I'm just trying to be efficient and not have to create two backends this morning. So just ignore those. We're not going to be ordering any picnic baskets today, like in this project. Um, but yeah, we're going to create, as it says in the in the guide, a class. It's going to be custom. It's always custom. Don't worry about this other stuff. It's for other more advanced parse type things. We're going to call it task. And we're going to click on create. You can also click create and add columns to go a bit faster, but we'll just follow 
the guide we create. So now we have a task class, which is in the kind of custom list of classes, not with the core list, your role, session, and user are things that every parse database has and you can't get rid of and you shouldn't get rid of because the session is necessary for people logging in. The user is necessary for people logging in and the role is necessary if you want to go down the road of making access control lists one day, which you probably should because it's good for security. But anyway, not rambling, carrying on with the tutorial. So we're going to click on uh, add column to add a column to the class. So a column is like a field, basically, if you had a form and you're filling in fields, name, first name, last name, email address, well, these are all going to go somewhere. They're all going to have to go into columns. So we've added a column. We're going to select the data type, which is Boolean in this case. Oh no, we're going to create a, sorry, we're going to create a description. Now, in terms of naming conventions, do you use small letters, big letters? Um, my top recommendation is to not use spaces because as you can see, it doesn't let me use spaces here. And spaces in general are a really bad idea for anything to do with API calls. It's not going to like having spaces in the field names. So if you want to put like ask description, don't write it like this, write it in is it snake case description like this. So first letter is small, second letter is big, every other letter is big. Do it like that. So but anyway, we want to call it description. Um, if there's a default value, it's really up to you. Do you want that every time this record is created, if no value is specified by the process that's creating the record, do you want there to be a default value? Maybe everybody's name is user unless they specify a name or something like that. Um, or every task is called new task until the user actually specifies a name for it. So at least it has a name in the database, but we don't need that. And is it a required field? This is really not just a existential question. Do we really need this field? It's a question of if there's a create record node or an, yeah, a create record node and in your development, you don't specify the description should the process break and fail. In case maybe you want to say, well, my app won't work if there's no descriptions, it'll look really silly. So I would rather be reminded myself as the developer that I need to put in a connection to the description every time a record is created. That's where it'll, you know, your editor, your noodle editor will throw an error and say, can't create record, no description. And you say, oh yes, I need to add a description. I forgot to connect it. It's that kind of question. It's not, do I really want to have a description all the time? So I would say yes, because I do want to have a description and I want to be reminded if there isn't one. So then we can click on add column, add or add and continue. So we actually need two uh, fields. So we're going to um, create another one that's called Boolean. So a Boolean is true or false. The only two values it can be. String was the last one. String is a text. Number is in or integer means like a whole number or a decimal number. You have dates, so it's like, um, what do you call them? ISO dates. So like a kind of that very standardized formatting of a date that takes into account time zones and all those things. You can also store objects and arrays, geo points and stuff like Google, you know, um, latitude and longitudinal points. If you want to use Google Maps or another map project, uh, Polygon, I have no idea about. Files is the specific Noodle backend file uploader. So that's if you want to upload your files directly to the Noodle parse file uploader, we can come to that in another another day. And pointers and relations way down the road, but pointers are, I want to store a reference to another class, to another record, one other record in another class. And rec relation is I want to create a sort of ghost table in between two classes that will keep um, track of relationships between two classes like this class record has two relationships with this other class and etc. So it's all more complex stuff you don't need to know about, but it's fun just to know that these things exist and that uh, all of this is in your future <laughs> to learn about all these things. Right now it's just a Boolean. We're going to call it, um, what were we going to call it? Done. And it's going to be by default false. And it is also going to be required because if we don't have whether it's done or not, then we can't display if it should be ticked or not. So that would be required and we click on add. So now you can see we have description and done in the task class. So that's perfect. Now we need to actually add some tasks because look, it's all empty here, isn't it? 
Sounds very condescending. So um, the first thing we're going to do is go to components. So we're going to click on the components icon and we're going to um, go into the add task component. We're going to add a create new record. So not array or object, create new record. It's in the cloud data because this is the noodle backend that we're using, create new record. We're going to select the class, which is automatically populated with all of the classes you've created. If ever you create a new class and you don't see it here, it's just a bug, just exit the project and go back into it and then click the node again and you'll see the class that you just created. Sometimes it just needs to synchronize with the, the back end or double check that your Docker is turned on just in case it's maybe not picking up um, the, the class names from Docker. So we're gonna create a task and you can see it's already filled in the properties fields done and description which we can type manually, but we don't want to do that. So undo that. And then there's access control rules here, which we'll talk about way down the line, but that's related to roles, which we looked at earlier, um, and who, you know, who can access this data or not. But we don't need to worry about that for our tutorial app. So we've created a new record. We've selected task. We're going to connect the text input to the node task. We're going to connect the text property to the description property, which means that any text that's typed in here is going to go into, is going to pre-fill this request that we're going to make to the database to create a, a new task record. And then we also need to connect the on enter event. So when someone taps enter on the keyboard, then we should do this task. So these are called signals. You can see that they have a little lightning bolt next to them. It's like event listeners. So when something happens, then something else should happen. And this is the, the heart and soul of workflows in Noodle. When you connect one lightning bolt, one event, one um, signal to another signal, you see a blue line and that blue line will indicate when this happens, then this happens. So you, in the end, later on, you're gonna have a whole big bunch of twisty spaghetti noodles um, following the blue line is gonna show you the process by which your app functions. It's gonna be um, asynchronous. So we're working with kind of asynchronous concepts from JavaScript where each thing is gonna be run one by one, not all at the same time. And that's really important to make your app work correctly in most cases, not in all cases. Sometimes you don't have to connect a signal, some things just run synchronously. You can actually use synchronous JavaScript in um, Noodle where everything will just run immediately whenever the page is loaded without any consideration to the other code on the page. But if we need things to run in an order, like when I input and I hit enter, then a task is created, not before. <laughs> and then a pop-up is shown to say, thanks for creating a task. That asynchronicity is what we're looking for with the blue signal connection. So we've done the um, on enter. Now we need to add the buttons, click, signal so when the button is clicked then it should also do the task okay and so we have done it we can test it we can type in a description here saying this is an awesome task we can click add task you're going to see hopefully the whole thing light up there you go lit up and then when we go back into our data tab and we look and we click open dashboard on the back end that we've chosen. Then when we go into the task field, if you don't see anything here, click refresh. It might just be that the when the viewer is open, it doesn't auto refresh. You have to refresh it manually or you close it and open it and it refreshes. But if you don't see your data, don't worry about it. It's there. And there's the description. We can drag it out, have a look at it. It's false. We can double click on the object ID and it will bring up a little pop-up window that shows us in a more form filling type way what the task is and we can also change it from here if we want but um we don't have to it'll auto change it you can also change it from here you can double click on the description and change from here and then hit return and it'll also update from here we can also turn this into true if we want turn it back to false so there's a nice i really like the parse interface to be able to edit the tasks on the fly 
edit the data on the fly when you're testing your app obviously in a production app it's very dangerous but you know the amount of times somebody said i can't verify my email and i went into the user list and actually you know um, manually did email verified equals true to help them out you know that's what we do and in terms of data safety as well obviously this is one big um, best practice point for apps that are in the low code world because we have this visual interface with the um with the data it's like very dangerous to leave your computer open and have people come in on a production app and just have a look through all your tables and ooh, look at all these nice users i'm gonna export this and <laughs> take it home with me so um this is something to think about later on is like how do we make this database more secure um, and make our interface with it more secure so now we need to get into what a repeater is to be able to see the thing that we just created because it's in our database, but we have, we've got the connection out to the database, but we have nothing back in to show us what this task is. Um, so a repeater node is uh, here. You can read the docs about it. It's a node that dynamically inserts one component as many times as you want based on the amount of input data that you're giving it. So you're going to give it what's called an array and JSON terms. So an array is square brackets with curly brackets and objects, and it's all this very standard formatted stuff. You can look up JSON arrays on Wiki, or you can go and um, ask ChatGPT about it if you need some explanation of that. We're going to see some examples in a minute anyway. Um, but that's how the information is passed between um, different objects and fed into the repeater node to say, okay, I have three objects. Can you please duplicate task item three times? because I need to show three different instances of that task item with three different um, properties that are coming out of this JSON. So I can see three different items. So first we're gonna delete all of our task item placeholders. I could just drag, drag, select, delete. And then we're going to add a repeater node. We're going to drag the repeater node into the contents group as a child. Remember this whole thing about it's under there and in an, with an indent and therefore it's a child. We can't see anything at the moment because there's no data in the repeater. We're going to go into template and we're going to select task item. Again, there's nothing displayed here. We've only told it what it should repeat, but we have not given it anything to, to tell it how many times to repeat or what data to put into the, rep the repetition yet. So we've got our task item, that's good. Now we need to actually get the data to give to this node. So we're gonna go into our picker and we're gonna add a query records node, which is in the cloud data folder, cloud data drawer, I suppose. This node doesn't need to go in anywhere because it is a logical node. It's not something that's part of the visuals of the page. It's gonna do something and then what it does can output things that could help us with the visual parts of the page. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just a logical thing that happens in the background and the user never sees it. So we're going to choose task as the class. That gives us the option of filtering and sorting, which we don't need to do right now. It's all good. Um, and next, we're going to connect the items output of task. And actually, if you hover over it, because this is a, it's running asynchronously sorry it's running synchronously it's already run we didn't even need to give it a signal we can give it a signal but we didn't so it's already run just by existing and in here if you click on the little triangle you can see an example of a json object a json array with an object um, so you don't need to understand this straight away but this is how the data is understood between the database and the front end is it's transmitted and explained, it's expressed to your application in JSON in these key pairs. So you have a key and you have a value. So done is false, description is this, which is a string in quotes, and false has no quotes because it's a Boolean, it comes in um, pure, true or false form. And you have also by default when it was created, when it was last updated, this is the ISO date I was telling you about earlier, the standardized date, 2024, March 11, etc., etc. And the ID of the item, every item has a unique ID. So we're going to connect up the items to the items input of the repeater to tell it what items it should be repeating. Now, there's a problem here. It says feed the cat and not the description. Why is that? 
because we've given it an item, but we haven't told it what part of the item should be connected to what elements inside our template. So it said, oh, I have one item, so I'll make one template. And it's done that successfully because our template says feed the cat. So that, that's, it's done its job right. That's as far as we told it what to do. So there's no problem. We're going to go either to into the add task, no, sorry, into the, our task item component, or we can double click if we've specified a specific template, we can double click on the repeater and it will take us into the template that it's using. So here we have our item. You can see that feed the cat is there. So nothing is changing because the, there's no data inside the item yet. It's being given an item to repeat itself, but it hasn't taken any data out of that item yet, but we're going to make it do that. So we're going to add a record node. A record node will give us the data from one record. And as our repeater is repeating multiple different items, one record is going to, you're going to have one record per item. And that one record will give you the fields from each individual record inside each individual task item. So we're going to go up to the class and select record um, task. An ID source, we're not going to give it an ID source as an input. We're going to tell it that you need to get your ID from the repeater as basically saying you are part of a repeater. So detect that fact and get your ID from the repeater. And then you see that the data populates. So why a record node and not a um, object node is something we'll discuss in a future video where we talk about making your data queries and data use on the page more uh, efficient, optimized, to make the minimum number of queries to the database possible. Because that should always be our objective is to communicate with the database a minimum so that we can minimize the amount of in and out from our app and use the most we can in the browser. Um, but it doesn't really matter here because we've already queried, this record is already there, so it's not gonna re-query the record. It's just gonna use the record that's already in the front end, the user's browser, thanks to that query. We're going to connect, and the advantage of the record node is that when, when we connect it up to the um, checkbox, we already have all of the properties here listed, whereas with an object, we would have to list them out manually. So you'll see that later. It can be more beneficial to do it that way, but we'll, we'll see that later. We're going to hook up the description to the label of the checkbox. That means that our feed the cat label has now gone yellow all around. That means the port is connected and the specific value is likely overridden. It means that every time that there is a value of description, it will override this is a cat. So it means that we're not going to see that probably ever again. So we've linked the description to the label input and then we need to link the done value, which is false at the moment to the checked value of the checkbox. So let's see what happens if we go into the database and we change the done to true. And then we refresh the page. Oh, sorry, I needed to save it. Oops, don't quit before you save. Change done to true. Click out of it so that it saves it, it updates it, sorry. And then we refresh the page and then it's checked. Ta -da. Nice. So it's not in the guide. That's just me playing and showing you how it works. Okie dokie. So we've got our back end communicating with the front end. But as the guide said, communication is always two way. So we need to be able to update a record as well. Because if I tick this, nothing happens because the done signal is true. Me ticking it has changed its state, but it hasn't given any data to anything. It hasn't sent the data to be updated anywhere. It's just in the front end. So when I refresh the page, my changes are gone. It's just a local change at the moment. So we need to make it a, a permanent data change, right? We're going to add a set record properties node. This is the update node, essentially. So we're going to link the ID source is also going to be from repeater. We could just link the task ID to the ID that's supposed to be targeted to store these properties, but it's so much cleaner 
just to do it like this, ID from repeater. So the same as we did with the record node. The class needs to be set, which is task. It has the same fields, description and done, as we did when we created, but now we're updating. If you leave one of them blank, it'll just ignore it. It's not going to override the description with a blank description just because you don't connect it up. Only connections that are made to the set record properties node will be overriding the existing data in the database. So we're going to put the checked status to the done status of the node. And when this when the, when the event changed is fired, so there's a signal coming out of this element, then we also want to do the set record properties step. So whatever the output is, which we can pin here just to have a look. So this pin is really handy. If you hover over a noodle that has a value, it'll show you the value and you can pin it so that it'll always show up. So there we go description we can also see but we don't need that right now we're working on the, the done signal so when we check the checkbox to test it then we can see it's going to false it's going to true false true if we make it false and then check our database again you might need to refresh but here i don't because i closed it it says done false so that's been changed and if we change it again Go back to our database. Done has not changed because it didn't close properly. Refresh it. And now done has been changed to true. Just need to refresh that view sometimes. Perfect. Now we need to get ready to bin this record. So let's create a couple of extra records just because I don't want it to end up empty. A new task. Another one. And you can see how because it's linked up to a synchronous query node, it's running the query every time I create a new task. So it's bringing back these new tasks every time I, I create. And if we go back to our start page, we can see that now we have three objects in here. One, two, three. Looking good. And they're all going into the repeater, which is creating three instances of the new task. Um, oh, I missed something. Oh my goodness. Look, when I add a task, it doesn't clear the field because I missed a step in this tutorial because I'm not paying attention. So when task is created, then this should send a signal back on success to the input and tell it to clear itself. So now you get start to see that blue thing I was telling you about, like as it goes in, then it goes back out and does something else. There we go. Now I have a duplicate task. I definitely want to delete it. So let's go to our task item. Now we need to add a delete record node. And we're going to select again from repeater so that we don't have to give it an ID. It'll know immediately that, oh, you're, you're telling me to delete, to delete the current record of the current item that I'm currently in where I'm being clicked can be a little bit confusing, but that's how it works. We need to specify the task as usual, the class, which is task. And then we're going to take a signal from the button, which is the same signal as always, click. And we're going to click it, uh, connect it to do. So when the button is clicked, it immediately deletes the task. Obviously in practice, you might want to have a pop-up that says, are you sure you want to delete or something like that? But that's not, uh, not going to help us today. We're just trying to work out how to interact with the database. So now I can actually delete that record. And it's gone. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is I'm seeing in the, in the canvas, the results of the action that I'm taking on the page. So when I click the bin here, I'll see the button fire up. But the task that I'm seeing is always the last item in the repeater list. So I've just seen a signal fire from, for example, the first item in the list, because Noodle is showing you that it's working, but the actual data that it's using and the data that it's showing you is going to be the data from the last item on the repeater list. So that's something that I would like to change in the future, 
with um, tools like Bubble, I was able to specifically target each individual item of a repeater and be able to see what's happening inside that specific item, not just an example. This is just an example that Noodle gives you of the last one to show you that at least one of them is working, but you don't know exactly what's happening in other ones. If they have conditions, you wouldn't know if that condition is being satisfied in the second one. You can get around it by making sure that the last one is the one with the test data that you want to test, but it, it can be annoying. So I maybe in the future, that'll be something that's updated. Maybe it's already updated when you're watching this video and you can just ignore everything I just said. So that's it. And then if we go just to check in the back end to make sure that works, you can see that the task list now only has two tasks. So they were deleted from, from the back end. So we have a full connection from the back end. We have create, we have read, we have update, and we have delete. So we have the whole crud that you would need to make your application fully linked to the back end. So afterwards, what we need to do is um, filter our queries because we need to know how many tasks there are left to do. So let's go back to the main page. We need to go to the header. We need to add a query records node here as well. We need to add a query record, querying the task class. And then we're going to click on visual filters. We don't need JavaScript filters are really cool, really advanced filters that you can send to the database, but um, we don't need to use that right now. We're just going to click on add filter rule. And then we're going to select property done equal to, and then we can either select having uh, a value that we choose just, you know, I want it to be equal true or to, to false in this case, or we can add it as an input. So we can actually say, I'm going to tell you whether it's true or false dynamically based on an input, but here we just want to make it a value. So we're going to set that value to false. We want to know all of the tasks. We don't want to know all of, we don't want all of the tasks. We want to query all of the tasks where the done field is equal to false. So don't give me any ones that are true. Okay. And now we're going to connect the task query nodes count, which is a value that it outputs. Every query node outputs its total count to the number of tasks left to do. No, to the number of tasks left node. So count not items. We don't need the items. We just need to count to the text input. And now we have two items left to do. So in a future video, we'll look at how this is not the most efficient way because we're doing two different queries on the same page for the same thing. So we will look in a future video about how to use arrays and objects. But for now, this is just a really simple way to have a third task and have that number changed to three to click a task being done and have that number changed to two or one or zero when we've done all of our tasks. So now we have a fully functioning uh, task app that has a backend that will stay permanent. If I refresh the page, it'll always come up with the same tasks because I've queried a database that's running and that that's permanent unless we delete something, in which case it's only two tasks. So perfect. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned a lot and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one.